Hello, good morning. Welcome to today's presentation, brought to you by the Fundy Geological Museum. The museum is a proud partner of the Fundy Shore Winter Carnival, and we're excited about all the fantastic opportunities they've planned for this year. Look up the Fundy Shore Winter Carnival on Facebook for more information. Joining me today is Regan Maloney, our lab manager and education expert. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to remind our viewers that we're located in Parsboro, Nova Scotia, known before colonization as Awoka Mi'kma'ki, or the crossing point between the north and south shores of what will eventually be called the Nova Scotia Bay of Fundy. The Mi'kmaq people were the first people living on these shores over 11,000 years ago and are still thriving here today. We recognize and accept that museums have played an integral part in the perpetuation of a colonial-centric culture and the life and stories that are shared about Nova Scotia. We are all treaty people, and the Fundy Geological Museum is making efforts to decolonize how we understand and interpret this amazing land we call home. If you would like to learn more about the Mi'kmaq, please look to the DeBert Cultural Center or any of the other indigenous-led organizations who specialize in sharing their stories and histories. Now, today we're going to talk about sea monsters in film, folklore, and the fossil record. <laughs> Click on the draw. Um, so why are we so drawn to prehistoric creatures? Is it a sense of mystery, the fact that we'll never know with 100% certainty what life was like millions of years ago? Is it the thrill of bringing creativity and imagination into our work as we try to figure out how those animals lived, moved, ate, and raised their young? Why is the ocean such a compelling story character? Is it the danger? The fact that it's so near for so many people around the world and yet largely unreachable by humankind? So much of the world's oceans are unexplored. It is often compared to another world down there. Today we're going to explore these questions and more through the lens of film, folklore, and of course, the fossil record. One of the first true films is Lost to Time. Prehistoric Peeps was created in 1905 in the UK as a four minute long silent black and white comedy. Generally agreed to have been the first film to show dinosaurs, there are no known copies of it in existence today. While we don't know what the film showed, one of the more popular Prehistoric Peeps comics was the one you see here titled No Bathing Today. Gertie the Dinosaur was released in 1914 and is commonly assumed to be the first dinosaur movie. While this is not true, it was the first film to have a character with an appealing personality and it was the first film to use keyframe animation technology. While both of these films were created by cartoonists, the earlier film consisted of people in costume pantomiming their actions. Gertie is a true blend of silent live action filming mixed with simple line drawing animation. The Lost World in 1925 was a film made from the 1912 novel by the same name from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This somewhat black and white film was made with stop motion technology and was another silent film. It was the first film to be shown on commercial flights and the first to combine stop motion animation with live action filming. While most of the dinosaurs in this film are terrestrial, otherwise meaning they walk on land, there was the scene of an escaped brontosaurus swimming in the river Thames and then out to sea. The stop motion took 14 months to complete and the entire film was in production for five years and we like to complain about how long it takes movies nowadays. The 1950s really took this idea of dinosaurs swimming around in the oceans and ran with it. All three antagonists from The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, Godzilla, and The Behemoth, The Sea Monster were designed after reptilian dinosaur models, but they all shared one thing in common they all emerged from the sea. 
Nowadays, we know that dinosaurs were not in the least bit marine. At best, the 95 million year old Spinosaurus seen here could be considered semi-aquatic. But as far as we're aware, no dinosaur species ever lived in or was born from the sea. While Carcricles megalodon is the record holder for the largest shark species to have ever existed, it disappeared from the fossil record 2.6 million years ago. That doesn't seem to stop filmmakers from reviving the species every few years for horror action films though. These sharks were estimated to grow up to 18 meters or 60 feet in length. In comparison, great white sharks top out at 6 meters or 20 feet long today. You might be wondering how we estimate body length from extinct sharks since their skeletons are made of cartilage and thus do not fossilize the way that our calcium phosphate bones do. Well, there is this neat mathematical formula that takes measurements from teeth and gives an estimated body length. It's not perfect, but it is fairly accurate with all modern sharks and the few sharks that have fossilized with soft tissue preserved, so we're fairly confident in it. Last but not least is our movie friend of our movie friends is the Mosasaur from Jurassic World. I have to admit, when I saw this trailer of the Mosasaur hunting surfers, I laughed with joy to know that the new movies were going to have critters other than the generic dinosaurs. If you've seen this movie, you know that while the Mosasaur isn't in it for very long, it definitely stole the show. The Mosasaur in the movie is about 15 feet longer than any fossil specimen ever found, and they probably didn't jump out of the water the same way that marine mammals can today but mosasaurs were the apex predators in the oceans at the end of the age of dinosaurs. As if they aren't scary enough looking, mosasaurs had two terrifying modifications to their jaws that made them arguably the fiercest predators to have ever lived in Earth's oceans. Mosasaurs had a secondary row of teeth in its upper jaw in order to better hold on to and kill its prey. I'll discuss those evolutionary modifications in a few minutes. Sea monsters have been a part of stories that humans have shared for tens of thousands of years. Even the story of the Loch Ness Monster dates back to the Picts, a group of people that lived over 1500 years ago and would eventually become Gaelic and then known as Scottish. Stone carvings by the Picts were the earliest evidence for this beastly story, but it persisted throughout history from a biography of Abbot Columba in the year 656 to the surgeon's photograph in 1934. Recent and extensive LIDAR sweeps of Loch Ness and the surrounding area have verified that nothing even remotely close to the size of a plesiosaur could be living in the lake. Not to mention the lake is freshwater and all fossil plesiosaurs come from salt water to brackish environments. Lastly, the lake does not boast a large enough ecosystem to feed a single plesiosaur, let alone a community that would be necessary for the monsters to have persisted over the last 1500 years. A Japanese fishing vessel claimed to have found the carcass of a plesiosaur off the coast of New Zealand in 1977. This was accompanied by numerous eyewitness accounts that spoke of creatures swimming off the coast of New Zealand and Australia that were described as fantastical, mythological, or prehistoric. Fortunately, protein analysis was performed on the tissue from the Zayumaru carcass, shown here, which led researchers to the conclusion that the animal was most likely a basking shark. The cartilage around their gills and lower jaws are not as well connected as the rest of their cartilaginous skeleton and often decomposes and falls away before the rest of the skeleton follows suit. Both of these examples of living plesiosaurs have been debunked by experts many times over, but the collective human mind loves a good story, and what better stories are there than the monsters that mysteriously elude us? So we've covered the modern stories surrounding these animals, but where did those stories originate from? 
most likely they're all rooted in the discovery of fossils before we knew what those fossils really represented. Fossils of marine reptiles span the entire world. In fact, there's even quite a few plesiosaur skeletons that have been recovered from Antarctica. Marine reptiles are not dinosaurs and are more closely related to your pet bearded dragon than they are to T-Rex and Triceratops. There are living marine reptiles today, including sea turtles, sea snakes, marine crocodiles, and marine iguanas. Unlike modern marine reptiles, the species we're discussing from the age of dinosaurs did not diversify onto land. Instead, they lived, ate, slept, bred, and died in the water. So let's break down what Mesozoic marine repti reptiles really are. Mesozoic is the 252 to 66 million years ago time frame. Marine means that animals lived in a saltwater environment. And reptiles are a bit more complicated, but the big takeaways are they are vertebrates, so they have the backbone, and they breathe air through their lungs. There are three completely extinct groups of Mesozoic marine reptiles. The first we'll discuss are the plesiosaurs. They had two very different body types, the small-headed and long-necked variety we call elasmosaurs, and the big-headed, short-necked variety called pliosaurs. The shorter pliosaurs were active predators that swam down their prey and ruled the oceans during the same time that Canada's oldest dinosaurs were walking around on what is now known as the shore of the Bays of Fundy. <laughs> as time moved on, the long-necked elasmosaurs evolved to fill in the ambush predator niche and would stay very still in the water as schools of fish swam nearby. Quick movements of their necks would allow them to swing side to side and catch unsuspecting prey. Plesiosaurs of both varieties lived in oceans all over the world from 208 to 66 million years ago. However, they were on the verge of going extinct before the mass extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs, due in part to mosasaurs. These fiercely scary and incredibly fast predators showed up roughly 98 million years ago and are generally seen as being responsible for the extinction of pliosaurs as well as our third group of Mesozoic marine reptiles, the ichthyosaurs. More on those soon. Mosasaurs are sometimes nicknamed the T-Rex of the sea, and for good reason. These apex predators share a few qualities with their living cousins, vipers, one of which is the ability to move their lower jaws independently from their cranium, or the top part of their skull. The red box highlights the quadrate bone, which looks kind of like an ear in mosasaur skeletons, if ears were made out of bones. In most vertebrates, this bone is fused to the rest of the upper jaw, but in mosasaurs and vipers, it is a free-floating bone attached by cartilage. This means when the mosasaur chomped down, it brought its teeth together flat instead of the scissor motion that our jaws make. They could use this flexibility to walk back the prey in their mouth without letting go of it due to that extra row of teeth that I mentioned earlier. You'll notice the bodies of mosasaurs were fairly streamlined and the tail is long but thin. Unlike plesiosaurs who use their flippers to move themselves through the water, mosasaurs undulated their tails like snakes to move quickly. They could have used their flippers to add some speed to their movement, but most likely they were primarily used for steering and making quick turns after their fleeing prey. Our last group of Mesozoic marine reptiles were the ichthyosaurs. These creatures look like a hybrid between a tuna and a dolphin, and for good reason. Both, actually all groups of animals, were or are very quick and agile marine organisms, and that is due to certain body types being more effective underwater than others. While ichthyosaurs are not even remotely close, closely related to either fish or marine... <laughs> 
Let's start that over. While ichthyosaurs are not even remotely closely related to either fish or marine mammals, they did independently evolve long bodies with pointed snouts, large homocircle tails, which is just the fancy term that says their tails look like they're crescent moon shaped, and fins that aid in keeping the animal on track as it moves quickly through the water. All of these physical traits combined are what is best suited to hunting down smaller prey such as fish in the water. Another interesting evolutionary development in ichthyosaurs are the bones inside their eyes. Called sclerotic rings, these bones float inside the ichthyosaurs' unusually large eyeballs and help them keep their shape when the animals dove deep to hunt for their prey. Water pressure increases the further one goes underwater, and soft tissues like eyes can easily be distorted under that kind of pressure. These bones help the eyes keep seeing clearly despite that pressure. Another organism that has independently evolved sclerotic rings are birds of prey like hawks that need the added rigidity in their eyes so that they can keep seeing during the jarring impact of catching their prey mid-flight. Thanks again to everyone who's tuned in or watches this at a later date because we are going to save it and post it and share it on a couple different platforms. Um, if there are any questions, I'd happily answer them now. Do you have any? So we don't have any questions okay. um, yet, but uh, we're just going to give people a few minutes. Um, while that's happening, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the things you can do over the next few days. Um, so this is the very first event of the Fundy Shore Winter Carnival, but there's going to be uh, activities going on from now until Monday. Um, some things you definitely don't want to miss. Um, one of them being uh, a make your own chili kit. Mm. They can be picked up at the Parsboro Library, Advocate Library, Dominion Chair in Bass River, Wilson's Gas Stop in Great Village, or the London Dairy Community Church. Cool. These are free kits, and it has pretty much everything you need to make your own chili, as, long, as well as a recipe. Great way to warm up in this rainy season. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, we're, it looks like we're going to get a big storm tomorrow, um, but that's not going to be interrupting public skating. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of public skating events um, in both Parsboro and Bert. So please check out the Fundy Shore Winter Carnival. Um, webpage, which I will post in the comments um, for more information. And I'm going to go check to see if we have any more questions. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Regan. Yeah, we're really excited about the Fundy Shore Winter Carnival. There's an opportunity here to really encourage people to get out and explore your community, you know, that you live in and that you might not really know the things that the various organizations are offering. So this is a great time of year to get out and, you know, explore some new activities. Okay, we do have a question from Sandy Graham. Um, <laughs> he has asked, Danielle, did any of these creatures prey on their own species? Ooh, okay, so that's definitely an interesting question. Thanks for that, Sandy. Um, there were instances where we found stomach contents of mosasaurs who had eaten other mosasaurs, particularly juvenile mosasaurs. And so we're not entirely sure if that's, you know, a situation where it was opportunistic feeding, such as an adult mosasaur was swimming around and caught a juvenile unawares and just had it for lunch, or if there was a situation where, you know, the baby had died and it hadn't decayed so much so that you know, an adult just happened to scavenge upon it at a later moment. Um, yeah, it's not really clear when we find, you know, bones of the same species in stomach contents of the same, uh, the same type of animal. But, you know, it, it's been recorded in the fossil record more than a handful of times. So, you know, there's, there's an argument to be made that apex predators that are alive today, um, you know, like large cats, and even you know large bears, they will still be opportunistic feeders, meaning that they'll still feed off of you know freshly dead carcasses that they come across randomly, um, and that could be from 
you know, the same animal group. So, no, but that's a great question. Thanks for that. All right, we have another question from Megan McDonald. Um, she says, my daughter Ivy is wondering how big the Megalodon babies were. Ooh, that's a really good question. So I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. However, I know that we can find that answer. So we will get back to you and put that in the comments of the video because that's a really interesting question that I've honestly never heard the answer to before. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <laughs> Um, so that's all our questions okay. um, that we have right now. Yeah, so thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. If you have any more questions, please feel free to drop those in the comments, and we'll keep checking the page throughout the rest of the day and possibly even into the weekend because we know that other folks are going to talk about this video, and we're going to keep it and make it accessible online after we stop the live version of this event. So. Thanks again, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy as much of the weather as you can.